glad you're here today. Uh, so glad you're here today. And um, Larry, is that you and Hope back there? I think so. It is so good to see you guys. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. It's so good. Now, we knew Hope as Hopey. Right. And um, still, am. still am. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, Larry is um, from Longview. Uh, he went to Laterna College. And he grew up, well, grew up and, uh, at uh, LBT. And, uh, and what's, what's interesting is that uh, he rose from the ranks and uh, was a, an assistant pastor at the church. Then he went to California, did a great job in California, and, uh, and then came back and took the church after I left and it is so good to see you guys. It's just, man, it's great. Now you lost a little hair in the in the yeah. in the process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's so good to see you guys. And uh, uh, be sure I get to see you after the service. Okay. All right. Great. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the um, uh, to the book of um, Revelation. And by hook or crook, we are going to finish uh, the first chapter today. <coughs> My chair has shrunk. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can. Nope. So it's all right. Yeah, I can't. I can't get it. I'll do it later. Okay, um, in just a matter of review, we have broken, broken this first chapter down to uh, seven, seven things, and uh, first of all, verses one and two is the revelation of John's process, and um, the second is in verse three. And that's the revelation of God's blessing. And the Lord told John, blessed are those who read this revelation, blessed are those who hear this revelation, and blessed are those who, that keep uh, this revelation. Then the revelation of Asia's seven churches, or Asia Minor's seven churches, and we find these seven churches that were all in the area around Turkey. Uh, where the present day Turkey is. There was a church at Ephesus, and I'm going to give you, now we're going to study each one of these churches uh, in sequence over seven, it'll be over, I hope, seven Sundays. But, but and, and I'm going to give you just, just for a moment the, the context of why God is writing to them. And so uh, the first is Ephesus, and the key of Ephesus is that Ephesus lost its first love. Then to Smyrna, Smyrna is the church that suffered great persecution. The third was Pergamos, and that church brought the world into the church. Number four is Thyatira, and they allowed false teachers, or false prophets actually, to teach in the church. Sardis is number five. And they pretended to be alive, but were dead. Philadelphia, uh, the outstanding church during this time, was the church of the open door. And then finally, Laodicea, the last church he talks about, is the, the uh, lukewarm church. Now let me just give you a little heads up on, on this as we go forward. In the first place, these were seven real churches, seven real churches, and they all existed at the same time. The second thing, and we'll get into this more as we go along, but these were, a lot of scholars feel there were seven periods of time that the church of Jesus Christ went through. Seven periods of time from the, from the early church in uh, uh, in Jerusalem, all the way through today, these are seven periods of time that the church went through, 
and they went from uh, gen I mean, generally the church that lost its first love to suffered and so forth all the way through to the end, which was a church that was a lukewarm church. The third thing you need to know is that all three of these churches, even though one had a significant generality of all churches, each, one, each period of time had all seven churches manifested during that time. For example, just because I believe we're living in the day of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, there, every one of these churches are represented in this period of time. So, but we'll talk about that more. Then John's message to the seven churches, and that is grace and peace, and who is from Jesus, who is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits. And we found that the seven spirits were this, from uh, Isaiah 11, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And uh, those even now surround, surround the throne of God and, um, and uh, are with the Lord. Then the third thing we find in this area, and that's John's acknowledgement to the seven churches. And he represents Jesus Christ, first of all, as the faith, faithful witness. Aren't you glad he is? The faithful witness. Secondly, the first begotten of the dead. Now, in other words, Jesus represented us as he died, was buried, and rose again. And for every person that's died in Christ, they will have the same, similar, identical resurrection as the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful promise. But he was the first. And then Jesus Christ, the prince, of the kings of the earth, which we wonderful song we just heard. And Jesus is coming to be the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Then John's testimony to the seven churches. And he says to these seven churches, Jesus Christ is the one who loved us. Jesus Christ is the one who washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus Christ is the one who has made us kings and priests unto God. And Jesus Christ is owed glory and dominion forever and ever. Now, then the revelation of Jesus' second coming. This is not the rapture, but this is the second coming. This will take place after the tribulation, three and a half years of tribulation, three and a half years of great tribulation. At the end of that period, we will come back with the Lord. We'll be in, have been in heaven for seven years, and we'll come back with Him and here's how he's going to come. First of all, he's going to come with the clouds, where all, which allows all eyes to see him. Jesus is seen by those who crucified him. Jesus is coming. Jesus' coming will be met with wailing. And Jesus declares his identity. And he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I am Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. I am the Almighty. Now, the fifth thing we find is, and that is the revelation of the martyr's testimony. This is John, the martyr, who was boiled in oil and yet lived miraculously after that, was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And he calls himself in verse 9 through uh, through 12, first part of verse 12, uh, his uh, personal testimony is um, John said who he was, and he was a brother and a companion, where he was, and that was on the Isle of Patmos, why John was there. He was there because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, John's personal experience is found in verse 10, and it says, and in the Spirit, Word and prayer on the Lord's day. Isn't that an amazing thing? Even John, all by himself, on the Lord's day, which is Sunday, by the way, on the Lord's day, he was found in the Spirit, where the Holy Spirit was teaching him the Word of God, and he was praying in the Spirit to the Lord. What a wonderful testimony that is. 
And then he heard a great voice or a trumpet that was behind him. Now, in verses 11 and 12, we find John's personal report. He said, I heard, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And he said, write in a book and send it to the seven churches in Asia. Now, let's start in verse last part of verse 12, and we're going to read through verse 18. And then that'll be the message this morning. I'll start with verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flame, a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as it were burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet, and he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. I'm going to do something this morning I've never done before. And what I'd like for you to do this morning is I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. Now this exercise is not for me, it's for you. And I want you to try to get a picture in your mind of how you see Jesus. How you see the Lord. And I'm going to go through some things for just a moment. And I just want you to be honest with yourself. Do you see Jesus as a little baby? Do you see him in a manger, having just been born, being loved by his mother and stepfather? Do you see him as a little boy in Nazareth, growing up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Do you see him as a young man, 30 years of age, just starting his ministry? And seeing people being gathered unto him. Do you see him performing miracles? Making the blind to see. Helping the deaf to hear. The leper to be made clean. The lame to walk again. Do you see him teaching, teaching the crowds or answering the disciples' questions? Do you see him in the upper room sharing the Passover which became the Lord's Supper? Do you see him in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, let this cup pass from me? but not my will, but thine be done. You see him be betrayed by Judas when he kissed him on the cheek. You see the soldiers come and take him away to be tried. You see the soldiers spit on him Use the cat of nine tails on him. Mock him as they put a purple robe on him. 
You see him when he winches when the crown of thorns is put on his head. You see him carry the cross to Calvary. Is your image of Jesus of someone hanging on a cross? Saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then finally saying, into thy hand I commend my spirit. It's finished. Do you see him being laid in a tomb? Do you see him coming out victoriously? Do you see him rising into the clouds as the disciples stood and watched? Answer very carefully. How do you see Jesus? And now I want you to watch me. I want you to look up, because I'm going to give you, from the Word of God, a new image. Some, somehow a new image of Jesus Christ. I would hate for you to miss him when he comes. I would hate for us to be all caught up to heaven and you look around and try to find a baby and you're not going to find a baby. You're not going to find a young man but you're going to find Jesus. And it says in the book of Revelation, and in when John said, I turned and I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks is one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Now, I, I want to explain something, that everything that was built on earth, from the tabernacle to the temple, uh, the restoration of the temple, the destruction of the temple, the rebuilding uh, of the temple to the tribulation temple to the glorious uh, temple of the, of the millennium, those are only figures of the true. They're imitations. They're, they're, they're models of what's in heaven. We have to understand that. There is a real temple in heaven. A real temple where there is a real Ark of the Covenant. There is a real mercy seat. And on that mercy seat is literally not the blood of goats and bullocks, as has been all through history on the, on the mercy seat in the earthly temple. But there is the blood of Jesus that covers our sin and is the blood. You see, the Bible says we're, we're saved not by things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus. Now that word precious literally means it is the same today as it was the day it was put there by the Son of God in as he acted as our great high priest. You understand that? When Jesus went to heaven, said to Mary, don't touch me for I have not yet ascended to my father. He was acting as our great high priest, just like the high priest in the Old Testament did. And he took his own blood and he sprinkled it on the heavenly mercy seat. And that blood that was there sprinkled then is there as, as, as much as he took a, a piece of gold and put it there. As much as uh, a, a piece of silver when he put it there. But you see, silver and gold can be melted down. The blood of Jesus cannot be changed, and it's there. So we have to understand when we read these things, we are seeing the true living image of Jesus Christ for us. And so he, first of all, he says that he's clothed with a garment down to his foot. Now, most of us probably think that's a robe, and it certainly may be, but it's a garment down to the foot, and a girdle about the paps with a golden girdle. In other words, a girdle in this day and time um, is, is a belt. It's a belt that surrounded the midsection, and Jesus is going to be wearing a garment down to the foot and with a golden girdle around him as he comes. 
Then it says his head and his hairs were white like wool. You see, that's not a young man. That's a conquering ruler. But his hair and his uh, head were white like wool. And then it says, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. You see, that's, that's a little different than the compassionate Jesus that was on the earth, isn't it? But he's coming, and when people see, they see that he's coming to mean business. It's like a, a judge that is, that is judging a, a, a heinous case. And his eyes are, are fixated on the, the, the facts of the, of the case because this case needs to be judicated. We'll see his eyes as the flame of fire. And then it says his feet like unto fine brass as if they were burned in a furnace. And it's interesting because brass always signifies judgment. Judgment in the Bible. Remember the brazen altar and the brazen laver where the sacrifices were literally made was made of what? Brass. Because it was judgment there. Uh, uh, animals died there. You see... Uh, Bullocks died there on the brazen altar. Lambs died there on the brazen altar. Goats. Is that right? Larry, help me out here. There were, there were bullocks and lambs and goats and, and uh, pigeons and turtle doves. Those were the five sacrifices. They all died on the brazen altar. That was a place of judgment. And then before, the, before the, the priest and the high priest could even go into the, to the, the tabernacle itself, they had to go to the brazen laver where they would wash their hands and wash their feet and cleanse themselves. It was a time of judgment because if they walked in there not right with God, guess what? They didn't walk out. And only the High priests could go into the Holy of Holies on one day, the Day of Atonement, and do the duties of the high priest where he would present the blood of the sacrifice for the sins of Israel for the next year. And then it says, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. Now we know Jesus had to have a great voice because he stood on a, a mountain and he preached to at least 5,000 men, probably close to 5,000 women and the children that were all there before he fed them with the loaves and fishes. You see, Jesus had a great voice, but I'm going to tell you, this time his voice is going to be like thundering waters. And he had in his hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now I want you to understand that the sword of the Spirit is a real sword. Now, we don't see it today. We're to, we're to walk in the Spirit. We're to uh, claim the Spirit of God according to Galatians. We're supposed to, that's one of the armaments we have is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But one of these days, we're going to see that literal, real sword of the Spirit with which he is going to defeat Satan and all of his, ad, ad, uh, his uh, people that have come to destroy Israel in the battle of Armageddon with his sword of the Spirit and his voice. We're going to be there to fight, but we're not going to fight because Jesus will do all the fighting. But this is a real sword, just like there's a real... A tabernacle and temple in heaven. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Isn't that amazing? In other words, you ever as a kid try to look at the sun? 
Now they tell us when there's eclipse, you have to be very careful with your eyes because you can really burn your eyes. That's the type that Jesus is coming. And the earth is going to see him. Now this is the vision that God wants us to have for Jesus coming again. Grab a hold of that. This is our Savior. This is our Lord. This is our Master. This is the one who's going to speak one day and we're going to be rise to meet him in the air. We're going to spend seven years with him getting to know him better than we've ever known him before. And then we're going to come with him. And when we come with him, the world is going to get to know him as they've never known him before. As the song said, kings and princes will fall to their face. The wicked of the world will tremble because they'll feel everything they did to everyone else. And they will stand in judgment to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, 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 and in verse 17 it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. You know, sometimes... You know, we, we have this grandeur of meeting Jesus, right? And, and somebody, somebody will say, well, I, I'll tell you, when I see Jesus, I'm going to jump up and down and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really rejoice or I'm going to go and I'm going to hug him or I'm going to go and do this and that. I believe with all of my heart when we see Jesus Christ, we're going to fall at his feet. Amen. Where there's no pride involved, there's no, there's no foolishness involved, we're going to recognize for the first time. And, I, and again, hey, look, we all have this problem. Not, not you or me. We all have it. We've never seen Jesus like he is. We've seen him as the son of man. But in heaven, we're going to see him as the son of God. And we're going to fall down at his feet. That's what the world's going to do. You see, that's what the world's going to do. And that's what John did. Now, here's the wonderful thing. John, John said, and he laid his right hand upon me. Is that cool? He laid his right, I mean, here's John, man. He's prostrate. <laughs> He's less laid out. And Jesus comes and lays his hand on John. And he says, fear not. Fear not. And here's what he's saying. I'm the one that you've been writing about. I'm the one you've been writing about. Now, I look awesome. I look mighty. I look unbelievable. I look out of this world. You've not ever seen me like this before, but I'm the same Jesus that you've been writing about. And he said, I'm the first and the last. You know, isn't, isn't that a wonderful thing? Jesus Christ, who is, as Brother Jim explained in Sunday school this morning, who's everything, is personal to you and me. Now, there's going to be a little other differentiation toward the world who has to be judged because of their sin than the child of God. But with the child of God, he is our personal Lord and Savior. And he said, I'm the first and the last. last. Then he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive again forevermore. And John has to say, wow. Wow. I was there when you died. I was there when you were buried. I was in the room when you came and showed up and came when the doors and the windows were locked. I was there. I was there when I watched you go up into heaven. Jesus says, okay, well, yeah, that's, that, I'm glad you saw that. But he said, I'm alive forevermore. You don't have to worry about it anymore. I am the first and the last. 
I'm the one that died, was buried, rose again, and will never die ever, 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 ever again. Amen. 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 That's what Jesus said. So be it. And I have the keys. Now this is a this is a this is a little bit of down the road now. I have the keys to hell, to the place of the dead, okay, and the place of the eternity for the dead and death. I've got those keys. Okay? See, in a, in a day and time like we're living right now, we need to see Jesus. You with me? Oh, what's going to happen? Oh, the world's going to fall apart. Oh, it's going to... No, it's going to happen just exactly like God said it's going to happen. So settle down. Get off CNN. And ABC and CBS and the rest of them, okay? Listen, they're lying to you. The Bible is telling you the truth. And we need to have our confidence not in our government or any president, but our confidence in the Lord God. Keep our eyes on him and it will all be okay. (coughs) Like the little boy who uh, his mom called down for for supper. And he kept kept messing around in his in his his room. And finally mom said, son, get down here. And he kept messing around in his room and Finally, she said, son, I am going to discipline you hard if you don't get down here. The dinner's getting cold. And he came down. Mom says, what were you doing? She, he said, I was reading my book. And he said, well, what took you so long? He said, mom, the hero was in trouble. He had just driven his car off the cliff, and I knew he was dead. Well, what would you do? He said, I went ahead and read the last few pages of the, of the book, and he's alive, and it's okay. I can eat now. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is? We get so worried about our, our, our Christian lives. We get so worried about our families. We get so worried about everything else. Let me tell you this morning, I've been reading the last chapter the last few pages, and it's okay. It's going to turn out just fine. And then in verses 19 and 20, it says this. And this is the revelation of the apostles' purpose. Why did God spare John's life? Why, when they took him out of that boiling pot of oil and his skin began to slide off of him and he looked horrible to the point where they wanted to put him on an island all by himself. Why did God spare his life when he shouldn't have? When he should have died? He should have died a martyr's death. Why did God save him? Here it is in these two verses. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. You say, preacher, what in the world does that mean? Well, first of all, he said Jesus told him to write. To write. Now here it is. And this is what the, if you want the outline for the book of Revelation, it's right here. He said, first of all, write the things he has seen. 
Okay? So what's he talking about? <clears throat> He's talking about his three and a half years with Jesus. You've seen them. Write them. Write the people. Tell them how to get saved. Tell them in 1 John how to know that they're saved. Tell them in 2 John how to, how to pre be, prepare your family for false prophets. Write all the stuff that you've seen. Write it down through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's the first, that's the first thing. He said, secondly, I want you to write the things which are. Now, what do you mean the things that are? What we just read. Because I'm going to tell you, John is seeing these things in, in a, a realm of prophecy that we're going to see sooner or later. You with me? We're going to see the same things that John saw, but he's writing them because he's seen them. The things that are. Okay, that covers, basically, that covers chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Okay? Chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. And then the last thing is write down the things which shall be hereafter. Now, in chapter 4 begins the things that are going to be after the seven churches. After the seven churches have fulfilled Bible prophecy. You know, we're living in prophecy right now. We have to understand that. We are living literally in Bible prophecy. We, John, in the next, through the seven churches, is going to explain to us what we see all around us today. He's going to explain it because it is now. It is prophecy. And then when we get to chapter 4, he's going to tell us things that are going to happen after we're gone, after we're in heaven, through the tribulation, through the, through the tribulation, great tribulation, when we come back with the Lord, with the battle of Armageddon and the millennium. He's going to tell us about that and the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. He's going to tell us all about those things and how it's going to work. That's hereafter. Now, I know that's where you want to get, but we've got to, we've got to go in sequence. All right? And then Jesus explained to him the mysteries. He told him to write, and then he said, I want to explain these mysteries to you. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Seven stars. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, what does that mean? Well, what, is, what, is, what does angel mean? It means messenger. So do you know who the angel of Victory Baptist Church is? Me. I'm your messenger. And God calls me an angel. You know, I thought my wife was an angel for a lot of years because she was always up in the air harping about something. <laughs> But I learned this this week, and I'm trying to get her straightened out. I, oh, that's right. Oh, I, I better begin. Uh, Brother Charlie, don't send this to Ruthie, okay? But the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. Understand this. All seven churches had an angel. Had an angel. They had a messenger. They had a pastor. All right, And then secondly, the mystery of the seven golden candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, we have to understand that when he talks about a candlestick, most of the time we see a single, we still see a single candle with, with, that you'd light. That's what we, in our Western world, that's what we see. But in the Jewish world, what they, what they see is a menorah, okay? And a menorah had a major 
stick here in the middle, and then branched out with, with three on one side, one in the middle, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The golden candlesticks are there for one reason. What do you think that might be? What does a candlestick do? Light. It is supposed to light the world. A church is the place that lights the community that it's in. And it doesn't do any good to put it into a bushel. Follow what I'm saying? Now, it's a wonderful thing that our church has light inside, but you see, we need to take the light outside. We've got to be an influence in the community, an influence in our neighborhood, an influence at our work, influence in our friends, influence in our family. We've got to let our light so shine. Now, it's a wonderful thing to have that collective light, and we saw that when we had our, our candlelight service at Christmas, right? Right? We, we lit the candles, and all of a sudden, it got light in here. But the fact is, we need to take our individual lights out of here and light the community in which we live. So the, the stars are the pastors because they're key. They're key. And what are stars? They, they have light, too, do they not? So they have, they have two functions. They need to be light to the church, and secondly, they, they need uh, to, to be um, understand that they're the messengers of God's word to the people. Does that make sense? So I am responsible as the pastor of this church to send the message, not my message, but God's message to you so that God can light up our church and so we can walk out these doors and be the light and the messenger that God wants us to be. Revelation is a wonderful book. It's an insightful book. It's an encouraging book. You'll find as we go through that it is a convicting book. And may God help us as we go through this wonderful, wonderful book of the Bible. The book says that you'll be blessed if you read it. You'll be blessed if you hear it read. And if you take it to heart and live it out, you'll even be more blessed. We have the opportunity as we go through this book of the Bible to be three blessed. Or blessed to the three power. What a wonderful blessing that is. That we can have God bless us for getting into a book that everybody else tells us to stay out of. I trust you'll be faithful. I trust that you'll come back week by week by week, not to hear me, but to hear the message of this blessed book so that we can be ready when we see the Lord in all his glory. So much so we'll have to yield, hold our hands up just, just to kind of look in his direction and fall to the ground when we see him but we'll be prepared and not shocked but prepared when Jesus calls us home what a blessed thing that is let's pray